Uh, hello and uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second edition of this LUCS Language Policy and Practices in the Global North and Global South virtual seminars. Uh, well, uh, to begin with, as we many of us, we already know that over the past decades, language policy has developed as an independent discipline of research on its own right. And obviously, a due respect goes to our senior uh, colleagues like Professor Spolsky here and, uh, and many others who has uh, devoted uh, that uh, time and effort to develop this discipline as an independent discipline. But nowadays, over the past years, uh, rather than contrasting the divides between uh, the national and the grassroots level policies, uh, now there is a growing interest uh, how various actors within language policy uh, interact and position themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis policy discourses, which will somehow be um, one of the main voices in this uh, seminar series as well. However, the research in this field, what is one of these uh, interests that I would like to talk about here, has focused strongly on the context of global north, including Europe and uh, North America, uh, which has drawn ex extensively from these northern or western theoretical frameworks. So while um, what remains invisible uh, from this focus are the language ideologies and practices that have existed and that continue to emerge in, in, uh, beyond these few American settings. So uh, drawing on some situated case studies between Europe, East Asia, uh, Africa, and Australia, South America, this seminar series aim to engage critically with- uh, I think I'm having breakfast. Uh, well, uh, the main interest of this, uh, the seminar series is to create a dialogue between uh, like the future directions in the field in a post pandemic scenario. So I will go to the, the main questions that we have uh, for this uh, are, are as follows. Like uh, how are the language policies uh, connected to the discourses of social justice? How language policies are uh, interpreted, appropriated, implemented and practiced by different actors at different levels? What are the role of family within the language policy? Can home literacy practices impact the vitality of minority languages in national or transnational context, what is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on language practices in multilingual settings? So our uh, main panelist today obviously is um, uh, re representing LUCL, Professor Heisbert Ruten, uh, Director of Ed Education um, from LUCL, and Professor Bernard Spolsky, as many of us already know. So I will uh, just quickly Present Professor uh, Rutten, is, he is the Director of Education and Professor of Historical Linguistics. He is interested in variation and change in the history of Dutch, focusing on topics such as uh, written traditions, norm development, meta language, language contact, and multilingualism. His recent publications include Language Planning as Nation Building, Ideology, Policy, and Implementation in the Netherlands. 1750 to 1850, and also a co-edited special issue of language policy entitled Revisiting Hogan Historical uh, Sociolinguistic Perspectives on Standardization. So to you, uh, Professor Rutten. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anik, and thank you also for setting up this wonderful lecture series. Uh, again, after a successful, successful first edition last year, so it's it's great that you're doing this again uh, through the LUCL channel, so to speak. And it's also great, of course, to have, well, to, to kick this second series off with uh, such a well-known, if not famous uh, speaker, such as Bernard Spolsky. Well, there is, an, there is a big cliche, if not an enormous cliche that some people don't really need an introduction, but well, to be honest, it applies perfectly well, I would say, to the current situation where we have a lecture series on language policy with Bernard Spolsky kicking it off. So still, there may be some people in the audience, and it's a very big audience today. We're reaching uh, 189 now. Um, still some people in this audience, uh, can hardly imagine, but you never know, there may be some people who haven't heard of Professor Spolsky. So it's for them in particular that I will say a few words about, uh, about him. Bernard Spolsky grew up in New Zealand in a relatively monolingual English environment, as he tells in his latest book, 
but who of course became acquainted with other languages through religion, schoolwork, and so on, including, for example, Hebrew, French, Latin, German, Navajo, and so on. After studies and positions at various universities uh, in North America, including a professorship in, uh, in New Mexico, Bernard Spolsky became professor of English at Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel in 1980. He has published widely, and that's another cliche, but it's true, he's published really widely on issues of uh, language policy. Initially, often from an, let's say, from an educational point of view, and later incre increasingly from a, from a policy planning perspective, or from the perspective of language management, as he often says, following, I would say, the Czech tradition in language management. I won't go into or even mention all the publications, or even the recent, all the recent publications by Bernard Spolsky. I have two books with me here today. Uh, the first, I hope you can see it, is Language Policy. Uh, came out in 2004 with CUP, uh, Cambridge University Press, and the second came out just a couple of months ago with um, Edinburgh University Press, and it's called Rethinking Language Policy. And this title, Rethinking, is very apt as the approach to policy or language management presented in these books uh, is almost opposite, or in any case, quite, quite different. The first book, <laughs> is, well, I would say perhaps still very much enshrined in the, in, the, in the strong tradition of analyzing language policy at the, at the level of the, of the nation state, of the, the country, the, the state. Uh, and in the second book, and I'm, I'll show this again, in the second book, Spolsky follows the approach that he had already taken in his 2009 book on language management, also came also out with uh, CUP, where he analyzed L language policy across social domains and then not starting from the nation state and going down so to speak but from the family and then to the workplace public space schools and so on and then gradually building it up to the to the to the to the national and also the supranational levels and this is also the order in rethinking language policy the book that came out this year except that there's even a, an even smaller starting point than the family now namely the individual and the individual repertoires so we are having a sort of, let's say, paradigm shift, perhaps, from the high and abstract level of the nation state to the low and concrete level of the individual. And at the individual level, language management also plays a role, particularly also as self-management. And today, Bernard Spolsky will take up this theme, if I'm not mistaken, will take up this theme of management and individual repertoires uh, and well, without further ado, I would say I'm handing over now to our speaker of today, Professor Bernard Spolsky. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be speaking to so many of my presumably readers who have noticed me around. Um, I will First of all, try and share my screen, see if that works. Okay, does that work? You can see me, you can see the screen. Yes, uh, it works fine. Good. Uh, okay, the title I give to the paper is, Can Language Repertoires Be Maintained, uh, um, be, be Managed? And then finally, at the end of the talk, I'll focus on briefly the question of whether they should be, or shouldn't we leave our language alone, as some linguists uh, used to argue. The early model developed in uh, the book Language Policy, um, and then expanded in other works, uh, essentially was the three component model, um, where I argued that language policy would be best understood if one treated of the existence of three independent but interrelated um, components. Language practices are what people actually do. Beliefs is what they think they should do. Uh, a case like uh, 
he, modern Hebrew, modern Israeli Hebrew, everybody makes what they consider to be thousands of mistakes because they don't follow the, gra the grammar, which they don't know. Um, and the third, language management, which is attempting to modify the language practices or the beliefs of others. Uh, you know, when a father says to the child, don't talk to your mother like that, or, or when the government says, uh, as it did once in Turkey, you mustn't speak Kurdish in public, um, or as it now appears to say in China, you mustn't use Uyghur. Uh, these are examples of language management. Um, that model, I'm happy to say, people are starting to validate, not just argue about, and there's some interesting studies which have appeared in the last um, few years, last couple of years of people trying to validate the model in various cases. Um, now, language management, um, has, which is many people still call language planning. I just don't like the word planning because um, economic plans seldom work and language plans seldom work. A language management, a better term because it suggests trying to modify something and revising one's management, one's uh, modification, depending on what happens, has three major um, approaches, uh, setting functions for a language, determining what's an official language, determining what language should be used for what purpose, determining what language should be taught in school. Um, that's the status planning. Cultivation, which is modifying language itself, um, trying to add new words, to modernize, uh, to develop a writing system, to develop uh, grammar, to deal with the problem of language and gender that we're struggling with at the moment in any languages. Uh, do we um, say he or she or they or some other word to try and make our language more or less uh, gender neutral? And the third co important component uh, adding speakers, which is the whole field of language education, the field particularly uh, that I call educational linguistics, but lots of people still call applied linguistics. Um, looking closer at language management, um, there are some problems. And the first problem is, what's a language? We're lang modifying language. Are we modifying the function of language, or are we modifying a specific named language? For instance, what's English? Look at all the different uh, places where English is spoken. Or, or, or what's Chinese? Look at all the different languages, and they really are quite distinct. The speakers of Cantonese have to learn Mandarin as a, foreign, uh, as a second language. The speakers of Hakka don't understand the speakers of Cantonese and so on, but we call them all Chinese. And when we count, we say Chinese is the most common language in the world, but that's like saying Indo-European is the most common language in the world. There's the same kinds of variation between Hakka and, uh, and Cantonese and Mandarin, as there is between English and French and German. Um, now, there's a definition, uh, two di quite distinct distinctions. Uh, uh, one could talk about a language, or as I prefer to do now, to talk about a linguistic repertoire. A language is a named variety. It's got a name. It recognizes the language by linguists 
uh, by speakers and officially recognized by the International Standards Organization, which claims that it bases its definition of languages on mutual unintelligibility. Now, if it did that, it wouldn't consider Hakka and Cantonese Chinese. It, that would consider them as separate languages. Um, and it turns out that named languages are better defined politically than linguistically. On the other hand, um, the notion of linguistic repertoire, it dates back to the 60s or 70s. Um, John Compitz and Del Himes <clears throat> uh, had a very good definition. The totality of linguistic resources including both invariant forms and variables available to members of particular communities. That's all the words and grammar and sounds you know in all the languages that you've had experience <laughs> with. To understand why it's political rather than linguistic, take the example of the languages of former Yugoslavia. While Tito was still in power, the official position was there was one language, Serbo-Croatian. And since the end of the of Tito and of his control of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia has broken into separate pieces, and each piece claims that it has its own language, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, Slovenian. Kosovan even. And interestingly enough, the ISO recognizes this as soon as the political change is made. The repertoires, on the other hand, grow up in the individual speakers as they, we, he, she, and all move into more complicated situations. We start off in the home where we pitch up certainly the language of our parents and maybe the languages of others. We go to school where we expand our repertoire, possibly adding completely different named variety. Uh, we go to work where we're required to pick up and use other kinds of language in order to deal with the demands of our job. Uh, that leads to an understanding of the complexity of, uh, of a repertoire of model languages. Uh, there's some notions that are quite common nowadays. People talk about, well, first they talked about code mixing where in the middle of a sentence, somebody switches from one language to another, as in the middle picture, or talk about this as translanguaging, accepting the common mixture of languages that occur in a uh, mixed community. Uh, that's not new. Um, Pablenko has just written a very interesting book that deals with much earlier stages of multilingualism. And it's the case that if you look back into the Middle East, um, or particularly, we'll say, the Mediterranean, it was very common to find cities where many different varieties were used and probably mixed. Um, and nowadays, of course, uh, with the complexities of huge amount of migration, we have what are referred to as super diverse cities where many different language varieties uh, occur, even in shop signs, uh, certainly even more in speech. Um, so our problem in language policy 
is should we be interested in language varieties? Should we study who uses English, for example? Or should we be interested in people? Um, what happens to individuals in various parts of the world when they get together? How do they uh, deal with the problems uh, uh, involved? In, in other words, what I'm arguing is that we're not so much talking about managing languages as talking about, oh, that sounds pompous and little, uh, modifying the linguistic repertoire of speakers, uh, adding new words, new grammar, uh, new expressions, uh, whatever they come from to the people in the community. Um, there are some related questions, of course. Uh, one way to modify uh, linguistic repertoire is to give speakers a reason to choose a certain variety. Um, if you want to go to university, it used to be the case for a while in Eastern in Western Europe, you had to learn Latin and later on Greek. Uh, then it changed. And nowadays, in most uh, nations, it becomes particularly useful to know English in order to carry on your education or your work. Uh, so that's status planning. Acquisition planning is what prepares people to do that. And corpus planning is modifying the lexicon or grammar uh, or the writing system in order to make that possible. There are some other questions that come up. Um, language rights uh, is an intriguing question, but are we talking about the rights of a language? Does an abstract object have rights? Or are we talking about the human rights of individuals to use whatever language they find most appropriate? When we talk about language death, are we talking about the loss of an abstract object? Or are we talking about speakers who no longer use a particular variety? So in language policy, one can ask, what is success? and what is failure. But uh, we ask success. Success for whom? Success for the speakers. Uh, success for the activist groups. We'll say the revivers of Esperanto or uh, the people trying to activists for Esperanto or the revivers of um, Maori or the people who are trying to revive Cornish um, are they the ones whose success we count? Or are we asking about the society? Oh, of course, uh, what we're usually asking about, uh, because the power tends to be there, is how successful is the state in setting up a working system where communication uh, can be used? So, uh, obviously, the, the best example at the moment is um, the endeavors of the Chinese to get everybody speaking Mandarin. Uh, and are we talking about shift, going from one language to another, or maintenance, uh, or spread? And are we talking about the stages uh, of literacy, developing literacy for a language, uh, many, many of the 7,000 languages or so that exist don't have writing systems and have no chance of being used in school. Or standardization, the problem faced by many varieties um, that seeing there are so many different um, varieties, it's very hard to get textbooks and, and newspapers written in something that everybody could read. Uh, one thinks about the Fascinating example of Norway, where having decided to move their language away from Danish, they couldn't quite decide which variety to use. 
So they came up with two distinct varieties. And for many years, different political parties supported a different uh, variety. So the children in school had to learn two spelling and writing systems, two grammar systems, two completely different systems. But fortunately, the Norwegians said that whatever you do while you're teaching them to read or write these two versions, don't interfere with the local way they speak, as a result of which uh, they still had uh, good communication. Or the problem of modernization, which faced by many, many languages. Uh, what, what's failure for language policy? Uh, no change, leave it as it is. The loss of varieties. The fact <coughs> that we expect, just as biodiversity is leading to reduction in the number of varieties of biological uh, creations, so we are finally losing several languages, many languages, every year. Are we talking about the loss of speakers of a particular variety? Are we talking about a language policy that builds a social gap, uh, as happened with the development of uh, elite education in a different variety? Um, or are we talking about undesired hybridization, the mixture of languages that often occurs, or the loss of group identity that comes when a new language is formed and an old language is lost? So talking about the national uh, domain, the national area, national level, national language policies, management, often fail. They fail for a number of reasons. The first is presumably that the plan or policy ignores what's going on at other levels and other domains. Uh, for example, um, the national policy says, let's all speak one language, but individuals or groups or religious groups or ethnic groups want to speak other lang uh, languages. Or um, the plan ignores really what's going on. Uh, Thailand is a wonderful example uh, where everybody, the, the, the official position for a long time was, and I suspect still is, that everybody speaks Thai. That's not in fact the case. Only a minority speak Thai. The others speak either variants of uh, 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 dialects, which are quite distinct from the standard language. Or in the South, they speak varieties of Malaysian. Um, or, as I'll mention again uh, in more detail, somebody comes up with a policy that non-linguistic factors, civil international wars, disease, weather, poverty, corruption, prevent any uh, implementation of the policy. Or individuals or groups resist the policy. Now, we look at the family. Um, failure often arises again because there's no, we'll say in a mixed marriage, where two people who speak different languages can't quite agree how to deal with the situation or with its individual resistance and individuals decide they want to speak a different language. <coughs> or in the family, where there's pressure from outside the home, the peer group, the neighborhood, the kids who come in to play with the seven-year-olds and speak a different variety, or certainly school, because the school language instruction, as I say in a moment, is commonly not the language spoken in the home. Or political and activist groups pushing a particular language. Or institutions, including religious organizations, 
um, churches, sects want to push a particular language, or the state has a different policy and wants the individuals to change. Um, one thinks of the example of uh, Singapore, where the government was particularly successful in forcing Mandarin on non-Mandarin speakers. But working against that, there is a strong pressure always to pass on language. Mothers and fathers want to be able to communicate with their children. And natural intergenerational transmission, as long as it goes on, is particularly powerful until somebody from outside interferes with it. I think again of the example in New Zealand where in the 1930s and 40s, the social workers told the mothers to stop speaking Maori to their children and to start speaking English. And uh, 40 years later, there had to be a major attempt, and there has been a major attempt, to reestablish natural intergenerational transmission. Um, or something that I learned from one of my grandsons, the young language manager. Um, normally, when the older children, the older siblings go to school, they start switching to the language of the school. In this particular case, the youngster refused to give up on speaking English, even though his older brother and sister had already, were already at school and were already speaking Hebrew happily. And he'd refused to play with them unless they would play in English, the language of the parents. As time went on, he obviously uh, had to work very hard to keep that up. He brought home English speaking friends for many years and then moved on um, finally finishing up as a fluent speaker of Hebrew uh, in the army and so on. But for a stage, he was resisting, and that was important. Um, another major interference with the home is, of course, the pressure of the teaching of the national language and other favored variants, varieties. And that's done especially through school. Um, it was a shocking fact that one has to keep remembering. 40% of the children in the world come to school and are taught in a language they don't know because they don't speak it at home before they came to school. Now, there are all sorts of reasons for that, but the effect is obviously um, the slowing down of the education of those children. And it's such a huge number, uh, it's going to be even larger as a result of the pandemic closing schools. <coughs> um, I think of uh, when I first uh, moved to New Mexico, and started working on the Navajo uh, reservation. I visited a very large Bureau of Indian Affairs school um, about 200 miles west of Albuquerque where uh, the university was. And I walked around the school and in every classroom, I found a teacher teaching in English and students sitting there not understanding because they didn't know English until they came to school. They were Navajo speakers. Only in one classroom did the teacher say, you think it's all right? I let the children speak to each other in Navajo and help each other. So language education becomes a particularly difficult problem 
it's so hard to find teachers who know the language of the children. And at the time I first started working with Navajo situation, there were about 30,000 children in school and about 80 of the teachers in the system actually were Navajos. All the rest were English speakers and couldn't communicate. So to get teachers who are trained, and that was one of the first major project, projects we got started with the help from other universities, um, was to train teachers capable of communicating with their pupils. Or, of course, <clears throat> the problem of getting resources for a decent education with small enough classes. Or the problem with the state of the language, if one's trying to teach in a certain language, uh, can that language be used for science? Is the word in that language for a microscope? Are the scientific articles written in that? Or does everybody have to learn English in order to study science? Or in getting jobs um, in the workplace? To what extent does the workplace demand language knowledge? I think of the example of um, my daughter, who's the CEO of a logistics company uh, in Israel. Uh, her her uh, workers, uh, some of them are Palestinians, some of them are Israelis. Um, <coughs> but when she's hiring, she needs to hire engineers who are capable to talk about their work with people in America so that knowledge of English becomes a requirement for a job in a technological IT firm in Israel. And that's happening, of course, in much of the world. Well, well, the problem is, becomes the problem of managing languages in multilingual societies. <coughs> Excuse me. And with increasing um, immigration all over the world, more and more societies become more and more uh, multilingual. Now, if you're just dealing with a historical situation, uh, it's easy enough to set up a territorial solution. Uh, in India, for example, uh, the states were initially established according to the language of uh, the speakers, the majority of the speakers, so that in the south it's Tamil uh, or Kannada, and further north it's Telugu or Marathi, or in the west it's Gujarati. Each variety it fits its particular location. And a country like Switzerland or Belgium divides itself not into bilinguals because there are as many bilinguals as one would expect, but into monolingual French and monolingual Flemish uh, speaking areas. And that kind of territorial division uh, works more or less. Of course, it's uh, much more difficult to do that with the building of large cities. Or in India, where there is recognition of the ethnic groups and some attempt to deal with uh, ethnic varieties. The European Union, I've given you the, I already talked about what happened in Yugoslavia when it divided. Uh, Africa is South Africa struggling now with the fact that for many years, if you asked about language problems, they told you it was English versus Afrikaans. Uh, 
we published an article, I remember, in the 1970s. We asked somebody to write about multilingualism in uh, Africa, South Africa. He was the expert. He wrote only about English and Afrikaans and the struggle between them. And nowhere did he mention all the other languages. <coughs> After independence, uh, it was agreed to recognize another nine languages. They're recognized, but it's not clear they get the support they need in order to really uh, work and build up um, as independent uh, languages. The European Union has an interesting uh, policy on language. It says that every individual has the right to be addressed in their national language. And it then re it, it recognizes 23 official languages. Uh, it doesn't recognize any of the immigrant languages. It lets individual states decide if they would like to give some kind of attention to other minority or immigrant languages, but officially it doesn't recognize them. And it says something interesting. It says every country should teach its own language and two foreign languages. Why two foreign languages? One might ask, well, obviously, if there's only one, everybody would have picked English. And there has to be, uh, in order to make it work, uh, some other language taught uh, in the country. So language policy in the EU is multilingual in a way uh, at a point. <coughs> Now, recently, there has been recognition of the problems involved in language policy. The early work in language policy, the work of the linguists in the 1960s and 70s, who advised governments and helped, uh, particularly in Africa, Asia, try and work out what to do when they became independent. Um, I think they felt that they were being neutral and scientific. They tried to understand what was going on in the country, what was the status of each of the languages involved, what could they do. Um, and in their advice, they tended to support uh, the mi minority uh, languages. Minority, when you're talking about language, is not to do with numbers, but to do with lack of power. Uh, but a number of linguists started to attack that. Um, Philipson, for instance, in an important uh, book, uh, his dissertation first and then published, um, <coughs> attacked the imperialism associated with English. He ignored the fact that uh, Portuguese and Spanish and French were even stronger in their colonial and imperialism, but he dealt particularly with English as an imperialist colonialist language. Uh, Skutnab Kangas attacked what she called linguicide, policies that led to the killing of a language, by which he meant persuading people not to use it. Um, Fairclough uh, added critical theory to studies of language discourse. And uh, right about the same time in the 90s and still, um, Pennicott has been advocating <coughs> what he calls critical applied linguistics, which is language teaching that takes account, account of the power and the way in which language policy can be used in order to support the powerful. So we do have some movement. Why is 
language management so difficult? What are the problems? Um, essentially, the number of language related problems, ignoring act actual language practices. For example, uh, I, I quoted, uh, cited Thailand. Um, accepting the idea of monolingualism is good rather than realizing that multilingualism is common and valuable. Refusing to recognize the diversity. Maintaining for an independent state, the colonial imperial language policy, essentially um, the way in which this worked is that during the colonial period, a small group of locals learned English or French or Spanish or Portuguese, which was the colonial imperial language. And very often they were also the leaders of the independence movement. And after independence, they were the leaders of the country, of the independent country. And they maintained their own personal power by insisting that the official language be still the colonial language. And this is true of much of um, Africa, for example. Or people give inappropriate values to various varieties, uh, or the variety that one would like to develop is not modernized or standardized, we'll say in South Africa, <coughs> And there just aren't the resources to do all the work of modernization needed even for the languages in the constitution. And if you got rid of those language related problems and came out with a good policy, you come across a huge cluster of natural and man made non linguistic interferences in implementation, the world in which we live, earthquakes, which was there in Haiti, uh, make education very difficult. Uh, the pandemic, which is preventing huge numbers of children from learning the language taught in school. Floods, not just in Bangladesh, but also in Germany. Storms, Haiti got storms on top of its earthquake. Droughts, parts of Africa are drying up. Wildfires, think of what's going on in Northwestern US at the moment. Wars and civil unrest, which follow normally independence uh, and struggles. The poverty of huge numbers of people and the corruption of which we've just learned a new uh, burst of it, where the people with money and power managed to avoid supporting, paying the government's uh, taxes that would support education. Now, with all of that there, it's very hard to, no, it's not hard to understand why it's so hard to change the language situation. But there are efforts. Uh, I think of, for example, the cases reported in, here in Israel, the people who are doing serious work to recognize the multilingualism and to try and modify the educational system in order to deal with that multilingualism. The schools where Jews and Arabs work together in Arabic and Hebrew, uh, not easy to establish because usually the Arab Palestinian teachers can speak Hebrew and very few of the uh, Jewish teachers can speak Arabic, but the classes are turning out to be reasonably bilingual. Or the difficulty of facing up 
to problems of ethnic uh, conflict. And somebody like uh, Joe Lobianco <coughs> appears to be doing fascinating work in bringing people together to conferences to sit around and discuss and understand the nature of their problem, what it is and what would be a reasonable way to develop a language policy that fits. So there is some moderate hope that things could change. There are hard tasks in trying to preserve indigenous languages. Uh, Teresa McCarthy in the Americas, uh, Florofine Corona Molina in South America um, are trying to do that. Indigenous language revival is a small but extremely important attempt at managing language repertoires. But I wonder whether government interference with language is a good idea. The Uyghurs in China are now in camps in order to force them to learn Mandarin and give up their native language. Mongolian is another language being attacked in the People's Republic of China. China has suddenly, in the last couple of months, reversed gears on English. It's, for example, banned the teaching of, the testing of English in, um, in Shanghai elementary schools. Uh, so I'm nervous also about language management. Who should be doing it? The state or the people who should be decided. So essentially, I keep rethinking, uh, trying to work out how to deal with this highly complex question of can language, can language repertoires be managed and should they be managed. Thank you very much.